Hi there, it's Laryl. Today I'm going to be talking about the Tank Mage Tower Challenge, which Blizzard reintroduced to the game, along with all of the Mage Tower Challenges, in Patch 10.0.5. They haven't added any new rewards, so if you've already done this during Shadowlands, you don't have to do it now. But the reward is just an armor transmog and a sense of accomplishment, so it's not like you ever really needed to do it in the first place. I just find it fun. The transmog you receive on a monk is an orange and blue recolor of the Tomb of Sargeras tier set. You kind of look like Tony the Tiger. It's very goofy looking, at least to me, but I like it. It's all right. Just as sort of a general overview, I found that this version of the Mage Tower Challenge was quite a lot easier than the Shadowlands version, uh, due in large part to the fact that tanks are way stronger as a baseline now than they were in Shadowlands and BFA and even Legion. And that's good. Okay, since this is the first video in a series where I'm going to talk about how to do this on every tank, let's talk about the fight in a bit more detail here. It is a two-phase fight, and both phases are single-target DPS races. They both seem like AoE fights, since there are adds you have to pick up, tank, and kill throughout each phase, but really, it's two single-target DPS races. So don't let that the ads like mess you up when it comes to the way that you're playing and the talents that you're choosing. The first phase has a main guy, Inquisitor Varus, and he has three mechanics. He spam casts Mind Rend at you, that's his main attack, basically his spell cast instead of an auto attack. It's not very dangerous on its own, but it can be thanks to his Aura of Decay, which is the big dark ring that surrounds him. Standing in it gives you a stacking debuff that reduces your maximum health by 10%, that stacks up to 10 times, so if you just try to run in and stick on him and just DPS him down, you'll hit 9 or 10 stacks, and then you'll have 1 health, and any damage you take will kill you instantly. So you have to spend most of Phase 1 jumping into melee range, doing some damage for a while, and then getting back out and letting that debuff fall, and rinsing and repeating. Generally speaking, I like to leave when I'm at around 5 stacks of Aura of Decay. The only exception is at the start of the fight, and whenever I have cooldowns active. For those periods, staying in melee range until you're around 7 stacks is fine. Varus's other main mechanic is Drain Life. It's a slow cast followed by a channel, and you have to interrupt this cast every single time. You don't have to use an interrupt though, you can use Paralysis or Leg Sweep or one of Prophet Velen's Holy Ward uh, orbs to CC Varus, and that will cancel his cast. It's just Im important to be sure that you actually do that. And I guess on that note, you do have two NPCs who are fighting alongside you. There's Corvus Bloodthorn, basically just auto attacks and doesn't really do much. And then Prophet Velen, who I think spam casts Smite for most of the fight, but does drop some, some orbs on the ground that you can pick up. They will full heal you and all of your allies. They will CC everything, even the bosses in this encounter for three seconds or so. And... Uh, that full heal on everyone is pretty important because if any of your allies hit zero health, you know, let's say some ads start beating on Prophet Velen and bring him down to zero health, the challenge is over, even if you were at full health and not in any danger. Okay, that takes care of Varus and Velen and Corvus. Now let's cover the other Phase 1 mechanics. Tormenting Eyes are little ads that Varus spawns around the room. They only have one spell, it's called Inquisitive Stare. It's a three second channel, they use it on you only, and if you're facing the eye when the channel finishes, it doesn't do anything. If you're not facing directly at the eye, you get knocked back. That's their only mechanic, but leaving these guys alive adds a ton of difficulty to dodging the rest of the mechanics in the fight. So I make a consistent effort to kill them as soon as they spawn, no matter what tank I'm on. They can knock you off the platform, so again, never let them knock you back. Just always kill these little creepy eyes quickly. They despawn as soon as you kill Varus, so you don't have to clean them up if you're right at the end of phase one and you're about to push Varus over. You can just focus him down, make sure you're facing them so they don't punt you off the platform, but just finish him off and they'll all despawn. The second type of ad is the most dangerous one, and honestly the most dangerous enemy in the fight, Smoldering Infernals. They spawn periodically throughout phase 1, about every minute, 45 seconds to a minute or so, and when they die, they don't actually despawn, they stay there in sort of a ghost form, slowly reform, and then respawn at full health. They don't despawn when you kill Varus, and they, 
they won't continue spawning in phase two either, but they do continue to reform. So if you in phase one with like five of them up, you're going to have five up at at all of phase two, you know, depending on how many are alive or whatever. And this is why you really want to zoom through phase one as fast as you can, because ending phase one with two infernals up is pretty manageable. Very normal. Three infernals is doable, but it is a lot tougher. Four is nearly impossible, and I think, like, if, if I were to make a challenge to see if I could do five at a time, I think that would be, like, some sort of Iron Man competition. I think that would be really, really difficult to live through five guys at a time. Smoldering Infernals only have two mechanics. They have Fell Resonation, which basically just makes them burn themselves and you and Corvus and Velen for a bunch of fire damage. They turn this off when they hit 20% health, so they burn themselves down to 20% just passively and do some damage. On, on its own, the mechanic is very basic and not very dangerous. It's just a little bit of free damage on you, but it can be a bit spooky if you have three or four of them doing it at the same time. Their other mechanic is the real cause for concern. It's the hardest part of the entire fight, Smash. They cast Smash in a large cone on the ground. It's a little deceptive. I've had plenty of times where I absolutely felt like my body was in the cone and I didn't get punted, and the opposite is also true. Tons of times where I definitely got out of that thing and now I'm flying off the platform. If you're in it when the cast goes off, you get knocked back and you probably do get punted off the platform. It's by far the most irritating mechanic of the encounter by, by far. When I did this on my monk this time, I actually one-shot it because I spent a bunch of time getting comfor uh, comfortable by being punted off the platform during Legion and Shadowlands, and I guess I just kind of kept that muscle memory there uh, for this time. Monk is pretty, pretty easy at dodging to smash casts, thankfully. My one death on Warrior was to smash. My one failure on Druid was letting Ads kill uh, Corvus. And on my Paladin, who I did... <laughs> last before writing this all up. I think I had one death to adds killing Velid and like 20 to getting smashed off the platform and then none to anything else. It's very dangerous. It's very annoying mechanic. I really hate these guys. Because the Infernals turn off their self damage once they hit 20%, you do have to finish them off to make them stop smashing. And while I wouldn't recommend swapping to them as like your primary damage target if you're able to hit Varus or Cruel at any point in, in the fight at all, for situations where you're outside of melee range of Varus or Cruel in Phase 1 or Phase 2, and you're not dealing with some other mechanic like the Tormenting Eyes or trying to get out of some of the damage pools in Phase 2, throwing a little bit of extra single target damage into the Infernals just to get them to die is a good idea. For most of the fight, they should just be passively AoE'd down, just passive cleave. They'll eventually die and stop smashing, at least until they respawn. And at that point, they will continue smashing. They never stop smashing. And that's why you pretty much want to spend most of the fight on the move. Okay, the final add in, in the fight is the Nether Horrors. These guys periodically spawn from portals around the room. They always spawn in four at a time. They only have one mechanic for Monk, Warrior, and Paladin, and that is Psy Talons. It's just a dot effect. They just apply a dot with every auto attack. It's very basic. It can add up to do a lot of damage, especially during phase one, when you're dealing with the aura of decay, you're cutting your health pool way down, and then they're stacking this ramping dot onto you. That can be a little bit dangerous. So cleaving those guys down is actually pretty, pretty important, pretty useful strategy. If you're doing the Druid, DK, or DH challenge, they get another skill. It's called Nether Storm. They do a three-second cast, and then they channel AoE spell damage to all nearby players and friendly NPCs. This usually isn't too dangerous to you, but it can kill Corvus, Bloodthorn, or Prophet Velen instantly. So CCing them to cancel that cast is very important. Alternatively, you could just kill them faster, and that's a good idea since their Psy Talents dot will stack up pretty quickly. These dudes do a lot of damage if you let them stay up for a long time. They spawn throughout Phase 1 and Phase 2, so, you know, you're pretty much going to be dealing with them the entire fight. They're the one little cleave aspect, kind of the misdirect that makes you think, oh, this is more like an AoE fight. But really, it's not. You want to be focused on getting through Phase 1 and Phase 2 as fast as you can, and that means the name of the game is single target damage. And that is it for Phase 1. 
if you're having trouble getting ahead of the third Infernal in Phase 1, I would recommend uh, using Drums and Potion at the start of Phase 1. If you're having an easy time, you know, beating the third uh, Infernal, you're just getting two, then I would say just pop your cooldowns and save your Potion Trinket, or Potion and Drums for Phase 2. Either way, you're going to want to pop all your cooldowns and your trinkets and all that at the start of Phase 1, and then as soon as they come back up for the rest of the fight. In Phase 2, once Inquisitor Varus dies, High Lord Cruel will fly into the arena. This phase is also a burn phase. It's very similar to Phase 1. It's quite a lot less annoying, though, and significantly more dangerous, because Cruel does way more damage than Varus does, and he doesn't force you to like run around the room and deal with little eyeballs that are on opposite sides of the room from you the whole time. This phase is more about testing your ability to dodge knockbacks, land interrupts, use defensive cooldowns effectively, and perform your rotation while moving the entire time. Cruel has four main skills. He uses Death Sweep, which spawns three purple lines at edges of the platform. They sweep across the platform and try to knock you off. You can walk around them, try to jump over them, which is what I usually do, or use Transcendence to cut through them. I mean, just teleport through. I prefer to hold my transcendences in case of an emergency. Basically, like, if I get hit by a smash that I wasn't planning to get hit by, and, uh, I will want to have a transcendence down already so that I can quickly transcend and get back onto the platform and not die. Nether Storm is, or Nether Stomp is Cruel's most annoying skill. He leaps at you and drops a giant green fire puddle that deals a huge amount of damage over time and puts a massive slow effect on you while you're in it. Monks are pretty good at getting out of the nether stomp, you just roll out. He also has a short cast time on it, so if you are literally moving all the time, like clockwise, counterclockwise, however you zigzag, however you want to do it, but if you're moving 100% of the fight, uh, you'll actually be a little bit outside of melee range by the time he gets this cast off, and so you'll already be moving away from where he's throwing it, so you'll have a little bit of extra reaction time to start rolling away before the cast finishes. You can potentially pretty much just not get hit by almost any of the damage of it at all, which is helpful. Twisted Reflection is a spell that Cruel casts every minute or so. You have to interrupt this, you cannot let this cast go off. If he completes it, he will heal for a massive amount of health every time he attacks you. I think it's 5% with every attack. The debuff lasts for 40 seconds or so, and you can't just kite Cruel for 40 seconds. The fight is just over at that point. So be sure to focus Cruel the moment he lands so that you can never, ever miss any of his interrupts. He only casts Twisted Reflection every minute or so, so you have a lot of time to be ready for that, and it is the only interrupt in this phase of the fight uh, that you have to deal with with Cruel. Finally, Annihilate is Cruel's main tank buster mechanic. It deals a huge amount of physical damage and puts a massive damage taken debuff on you for the rest of the fight. The debuff stacks, so, you know, this is why you really want to kill Cruel as quickly as you can. You want to be sure to use defensive cooldowns like Damp and Harm, Fortifying Brew, and Zen Meditation to mitigate uh, Annihilate's casts, or Cruel's Annihilate casts, once you have a few stacks of that debuff. Like, the first one is not too bad, you usually can just get away with, if you're at full health, you know, Expel Harm and Purifying Brew and you'll be fine. The second one you'll want a Celestial Brew, the third one you're going to want to have that and another major defensive cooldown, and then the fourth one, probably a couple of defensive cooldowns, and then... You know, the fourth cast is pretty doable with cooldowns. The fifth one is quite a lot harder. It's possible, but it's pretty sketchy. Anything beyond that is very unrealistic, unless you're rolling, like, several cooldowns all together. But the auto attacks by that point are going to be hitting very, very hard. You know, five times more damage than the auto attacks he was doing at the start of the fight. Alright, now I'm going to talk about gear. This is a time walking challenge, so your gear's item level isn't important. Itemization matters most, and trinkets are particularly critical on that front. Generally speaking, you're going to want to wear trinkets that increase your damage on Varus and Cruel. The best options in Dragonflight content are things like Manic Grief Torch, which is very good 
but can be hard to use. Like on my warrior, I have a grief torch and it took me a long time to actually find enough space to use that during phase two of the fight. I think I sat on the use up for like 45 seconds before I was able to actually feel like I could safely use it. Uh, Windscar Whetstone from Court of Stars is another really good trinket option. Definitely better than Grief Torch in this situation. Spiteful Storm off of Razageth is good. You know, you just attack, uh, you attack Varus at the start of Phase 1, get that rolling on him, and then attack Cruel in Phase 2 and get that rolling on him and you're good to go. Any sort of single target damage trinket that's been useful over the years. Uh, Cyclotronic Blast trinket from BFA from uh, Mechagon BFA is a good option as well. If you really want to min-max your gear, you can wear trinkets like uh, Chipped Soul Prism from Warlords of Draenor and Unstable Arcano Crystal from Legion. Those trinkets provide a massive amount of stat budget that is way above their item level. I didn't actually do that. Uh, I literally just went in wearing the gear I had on just kind of to prove the concept or, or just really kind of to see how difficult it was and I definitely found it to be a lot easier than it had been in Shadowlands. That being said, if you're struggling at all, optimizing your gear with trinkets like, like those from past expansions that have a lot of stats on them will significantly reduce the difficulty of this challenge and I definitely recommend it if you're struggling at all. Also on the subject of optimizing gear, I highly recommend enchanting your boots, bracers, and cloak with speed enchants. You can use drums and potions and fortune cookies to squeeze every bit of player power you can into your character as well. Potion of Unbridled Fury, which is a potion from BFA, a direct damage potion. That will do a lot of extra damage, and once again, because of time walking scaling, it's just way above its stat budget in this challenge. So, if you find your single target damage is lacking, or, I mean, whatever, if you want to make the fight easier, use Potions of Unbridled Fury. For talents, I'll show the setup I used for this challenge. I ran a pretty normal single target raid setup. The only thing that I really moved around is I used both Improved Roll and Celerity just to have a little bit more uh, mobility in Phase 1 to get around and kill those annoying eyeballs. You can drop Profound Rebuttal and Close to Heart in order to pick up Bounce Back and Black Ox Statue. Bounce Back is actually very good in this challenge during Phase 2, which is not generally how I feel about Bounce Back. It's a little unreliable, but for dealing with the Annihilate casts and kind of the following auto attacks, like it's actually a pretty good talent in this one case. Having Black Ox Statue is just really helpful for keeping ads off of Prophet Velen. I didn't use it because I'm kind of lazy, it just seemed very annoying to find yet another keybind <laughs> to uh, assign to Black Ox Statue, and I really just wanted to see, like, how hard is this? It wasn't so bad. You can also drop Face Palm and take Pretense of Instability if you feel like you need a little bit more defensive value. I think that change is extremely minor, but it's probably something I would do. I was actually running Blackout Combo while doing this as well, but... I think I forgot about that like a minute into the challenge and I just completely stopped making any effective use of it. And that is the problem with blackout combo. It's a good talent, but it's very annoying to use, especially in situations where you get forced out of melee range a lot. And that is what this whole challenge is. You'll definitely get more consistent value out of just putting two points into high tolerance in situations like this challenge. Blackout combo is technically stronger on paper and it's even stronger in practice if you use it well, but not by a whole lot, and it's so much more annoying, so uh, I just say take the easy road. Alright, I think that's it. I hope this helps you with doing this challenge. I found it to be a lot of fun, once again. Now I'm going to run the clip of me doing this on the monk in its entirety. And thank you for watching. Bye.
stand strong, champion. Do not give up. 